Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the second of the Clay Public Lectures for this academic year. My name is Jim Carlson. I'm president of the Clay Mathematics Institute. The Clay Mathematics Institute was founded in 1999 with the purpose of increasing and disseminating mathematical knowledge. Primarily what it does is to support mathematical research. It has a large postdoctoral program every year. It uh, organizes a summer school in a topic of interest in mathematics. Uh, it supports two very important programs for high school students, the Ross and the Promise program. And of course, uh, as part of its dissemination efforts, it organizes biannually or twice a year these public lectures. Uh, so this evening, it's my great pleasure to introduce Marcus Dussautois. Uh, despite the French sounding name, he is a professor of mathematics at Oxford. Uh, his specialty is theory of numbers and groups and symmetries. Uh, he's a very talented, gifted expositor of mathematics. Uh, he's been involved in the direction of films, uh, is the author of two well known books. Uh, one is The Music of the Primes, the other is, has just appeared. Uh, it is called Finding Moonshine, A Mathematician's Journey Through Symmetry. And I believe there will be a book signing after the event. Um, before introducing Marcus formally, I would also like to publicly thank Candace Bott. Candace, would you like to stand and be recognized? Uh, Candace. Uh, Candace does a superb job of organizing and publicizing these public lectures, and we're very grateful for her efforts. So without further ado, I would like to turn it over to Marcus. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, when David Beckham moved to Real Madrid a couple of years ago, there was a lot of speculation in the British media about why he'd chosen this number 23 shirt to play in. Every newspaper had their own different theory. Uh, most of the newspapers went for the uh, Michael Jordan theory. Um, uh, this one goes that uh, Real Madrid wanted to um, sell a lot of more football shirts, or soccer shirts, you call them here, um, out in America. I mean, uh, in America, I understand that soccer is not a very big game, and so Real Madrid wanted to try and somehow break the American market and sell more shirts, soccer shirts over here. Um, so, uh, that, you know, in America you like things like baseball and basketball, and um, so one of the most famous basketball players in the world, of course, is Michael Jordan, who used to wear the 23 shirt. So, uh, one theory was that um, the Real Madrid were just choosing 23, so you'd all go and buy it thinking it was a baseball shirt, basketball shirt, and, and not actually a football shirt. And Real Madrid will become even richer than they already are. So, so that was one theory, but the others said that's uh, far too cynical. Actually, maybe much more sinister reason why Beckham chose the number 23. If any of you know your history, then you might remember that Julius Caesar was in fact assassinated by being stabbed 23 times in the back. So some newspapers said it's a very bad idea for Beckham to be putting 23 on his back. Um, <laughs> but being a math nerd, as soon as I saw this number, I said, oh, no, it's a really interesting number. Because um, it's a prime number, one of these numbers which is only divisible by itself and one. And uh, I'm particularly sensitive to prime numbers because uh, about the same time as Beckham's move to Real Madrid, um, I wrote this book called The Music of the Primes, all, all, all about prime numbers. And uh, my British publisher, this is the British hard uh, back cover, and um, the British publisher let me choose my favorite primes to put on the front cover of this book. So um, I live at number 53. Um, my local bus in London where I live is a number 73 bus. I only go on prime number buses, uh, never tunes anything else. Um, and um, my local football team that I support is Arsenal Football Club. And um, we, we have a rivalry. I'm sure you have it between teams here. I don't know, who do the Red Sox? Who's the big rival with the Red Sox here? Oh, there you go. OK, so the, for, for Arsenal, it's uh, Tottenham Hotspur. And Spurs, uh, we just stolen one of their players um, called Sol Campbell, who plays in defense, and we've given him the number 23 shirt. So to rub it all, into all my friends who are Spurs supporters, I put a 23 football shirt on the front cover of my book. 
Now, a lot, of pub, a lot of the media saw this and said, aha, here's the guy who can really explain why Beckham chose the number 23 shirt. So I got asked on to various radio stations uh, to explain my theory about the 23 football shirt. Um, uh, we have a, you probably have it here in America, we have a, a radio station called Talk Sport Radio, which just talks about sport all the time. And I regard it as a real coup to get higher mathematics talked on this radio station. It's one of my big uh, achievements in life, I think. Um, anyway, on the way to the radio station, I was trying to think, okay, well, I've got to come up with a theory about this. So what's my theory about why Beckham might have chosen a prime number shirt? Um, so I started to think, well, what's important about primes for me as a mathematician? Well, primes are literally the building blocks of my subject. Um, if I take a number like 105, um, most of you, I hope, know that that's not a prime number, divisible by 5. Uh, then I go down to 21 times 5. 21 still isn't prime. I can divide that into 3 times 7 times 5. But now I can't divide any further, because now I've got to these indivisible numbers, the primes, which built that number 105. So, so for me, the primes, I like to call them the atoms of arithmetic, because they're really the building blocks of all numbers. For me, they're a little bit like the periodic table. I see we've got a periodic table on the wall here. One of the most fundamental things in chemistry, um, the atoms which build all molecules, starting with hydrogen, helium, and lithium, well, for me, the primes are like my hydrogen, helium, and lithium. They're, they're the building blocks of the whole of mathematics. Well, I started to look at Real Madrid's football team, and it's clear somebody on the bench at Real Madrid knew that primes are building blocks, because all the key players in Real Madrid at the time, they were all playing in prime number shirts. You had Carlos, the building block of the defense, he was in number three. Zidane, he was in number five. Raul, number seven. Ronaldo at the time was playing in the 11 shirt. So clearly, this person on the bench said, OK, Beckham's a key player. He's a building block of our team. We have to give him a prime number shirt. So they gave him the number 23 shirt. So that's my theory, at least. And, and I can actually talk about prime number soccer shirts from some experience, because I also play for a soccer team out in East London. Uh, we're called Recreativo Hackney. Uh, we chose a Spanish name to kind of frighten the opposition, but actually, as soon as they see us playing, they know that... Um, anyway, our team isn't big enough to have 23 players, so I play in the number 17 shirt. A very nice prime, a Fermat's prime. Um, but unfortunately, we play in the Super Sunday League Division 2. Um, unfortunately, our primes didn't do too well for us, because if you look for Recreativo, we're somewhere... Um, yeah, right down here at the bottom. So, uh, <laughs> But don't worry, this is the lowest division in London, so the only way is up from here. So... Um, uh, uh, but my prime number shirt did help me. If you look at the goals four, we scored 25 goals, and one of those is my goal, which I'm very proud of. But, um, um, but unfortunately, if you look at the goals against, we had 64 goals scored against us, and one of those is also my goal, which I'm not so proud of. <laughs> but um, anyway, I realized that we had to do something about this, and maybe Beckham was on to something, so I persuaded our team for the next season to change our kit so we now all play in prime numbers, 2, 3, 5, all the way up to 43, and it transformed our season. We became second in the league, we got promoted to the Super Sunday League Division 1, um, where unfortunately we learned that uh, primes, they only last for one season, because we've been relegated back down again. So I I'm looking for a new theory now. Oops. Uh, in fact, um, this is a t-shirt I got a company in London to design, um, which is the quadratic equation that every footballer, soccer player, has to solve um, when they're trying to work out where to stand to knock the ball into the back of the net. Also, baseball players, when they're trying to catch a, uh, a ball, they're actually solving quadratic equations to work out exactly where to stand. You didn't think these sports people were clever, but in fact, they can solve quadratic equations in their heads. So, um, that, that, so that's my latest theory. It's, it's working quite well, but um, we're still not doing fantastically this season. Now, every summer, Real Madrid get bigger and bigger, and they want more prime number shirts. So they come to me, the mathematician, and say, can we buy a formula off you for, for finding these new prime numbers? And um, they'll be very surprised to learn that we don't actually have some magic formula to try and find these prime numbers. In fact, trying to find where the next prime number is represents one of the biggest mysteries in the whole of mathematics. And it goes really to the heart of what it means for me to be a mathematician. Um, when I'm at a party and somebody asks, so what do you do? Uh, I kind of dread this question and look forward to it slightly. And I say, I'm a mathematician. And uh, you can see their faces drop. And they sort of back away very slowly. And their glass gets very empty. And they dash to the other side of the party. But I'm very persistent. So I run after them and say, no, no, no. We're, we're a very misunderstood breed, mathematicians. Um, and I try to explain to them what I do as a mathematician all day is that I try to look for patterns. I'm a pattern searcher. I try and look for logic and structure in the kind of messy world we have around us. And the challenge of the primes is somehow the ultimate puzzle in the whole of mathematics. 
Now, I'm going to start by showing a little movie clip from one of my favorite movies um, called Pi. Has anyone seen the film Pi here? Yeah, a few math movie buffs there, excellent. Um, in this movie, there's a mathematician uh, called Max Cohen who is obsessed with looking for patterns. Um, his particular obsession is looking for patterns in the decimal expansion of pi. So pi is this number which starts 3.14159, then goes on and on. And he's convinced that he's found the secrets to the stock exchange hidden inside this um, uh, decimal expansion. As the movie goes on, he kind of gets madder and madder. It's kind of Typical stereotype of the mathematician in the movies is that we always go mad by the end of the movie. This is no exception. Uh, he starts seeing sort of Kabbalistic messages from God start appearing inside this decimal expansion. But I love his passion for looking for patterns. And he starts every morning with his mantra of what it means for him to be a mathematician. So um, here's uh, Max Cohen from the film Pi. It's got a great soundtrack, actually. So, uh, so here is the decimal expansion of Pi. Um, if you spot any patterns, you can shout out. Um. He spotted a pattern there, you see. It's, uh, actually, when I say I'm a mathematician at parties, um, I think that's what they think I do all day, that I'm sitting in my office kind of doing long division to lots of decimal places. And uh, I hope to show you I do something slightly more interesting. There are patterns everywhere in nature, and I think that's the belief of the mathematician. If the, something is significant, then there is some structure and pattern there to understand. Um, but sometimes that pattern can be a little bit hidden, a little bit mysterious. And with the primes, I'm going to show you some patterns that are hidden inside these numbers. And what we're going to do is to take Max Cohen's advice, and we're going to graph these numbers, and we will see some rather strange patterns emerging in the primes. Now, I think that search for patterns is perfectly encapsulated in the kind of problems you probably all had at school, where you're given a sequence of numbers, and you have to try and spot the structure, the pattern, the logic behind that sequence to get the next number in the sequence. So I brought a few challenges along to see how good you are at pattern searching. Now, obviously, if you've got a maths degree, or if you're studying for a maths degree, you're not allowed to play on the first two. Okay, you can look at the third one. Um, but if you're not studying for a maths degree, don't have a maths degree, what's the next number in this sequence? 1, 3, 6, 10, 15, 21, 28. 36, very good. Um, and you've got these um, by adding, you add 2 to the number, 3, add 4, add 5, add 6. And these are called the triangular numbers because you can view them in a very geometric way as the number of stones you need to build a triangle with an extra layer added on each time. Now, mathematicians understand these numbers very well. For example, we have a formula which will help you to calculate, for example, the hundredth triangular number without having to do the work of adding up all the numbers from 1 to 100. Uh, mathematicians love looking for patterns, but we're also incredibly lazy at heart. So we like these kind of shortcuts, these formulas, to help us find um, uh, these uh, numbers without having to do hard work. And you can build up the formula by putting together two triangles, building a rectangle, and then it's very easy to count things in a rectangle. Uh, so these numbers we understand very well. Okay, the next sequence, um, if you're not studying for a maths degree and you also have not read the Da Vinci Code, then you're also allowed to play on this one. OK, um, so uh, if you haven't read the Da Vinci Code, what's the next number in this sequence? 34. Very good. You get 34 by adding the two previous numbers together. So 13 plus 21 gives you 34. Uh, 21 plus 34 gives you 55. And these are very famous numbers called the Fibonacci numbers. Um, and uh, they're really nature's favorite numbers. You find them all over the natural world. So for example, if you take a flower and you count the number of petals on that flower, Invariably, it's a number in the Fibonacci sequence, or sometimes double, you get two layers of a flower on it. And um, if it isn't a number in the Fibonacci sequence, um, then that means a petal has fallen off your flower, which is uh, how mathematicians get round exceptions. So um, 
Now, we understand these numbers very well as well. Um, we also have a formula which will help to calculate the 100th Fibonacci number without having to add up all the pairs all the way up to 100. Um, it's a little bit more complicated than the one for the triangular numbers. It involves taking powers of this magic number called the golden ratio, which expresses the perfect proportions in art and nature. OK, so I can see you're all fantastic pattern searchers. Um, so here's a little bit more of a challenging sequence for you. Uh, what's the next number in the sequence? Two. 9, 10, 11, 13, 16. Oh, you all thought it was so easy, didn't you? Fibonacci numbers. Oh, so. <laughs> Again, the mathematicians are allowed to join in. I know so there are some professors of mathematics here. They're allowed to play as well. <laughs> A little bit more difficult, this one. Well, if you could get that um, 26 is the next number in this sequence, I recommend you buy a lottery ticket uh, uh, next Saturday, um, because these were, in fact, the lottery ticket number winnings uh, in September of last year in England. So, uh, so none of you fell for finding it. Um, yeah, I don't have some magic formula, neither does any other mathematician, for finding the lottery ticket numbers. Um, if I did have a formula, I wouldn't be standing here talking to you now. I'd be sitting on some tropical island enjoying myself. Uh, so unfortunately, so you have to be careful. You have to choose your battles carefully because not everything does have patterns. The point about the lottery is that there is no structure there for you to help to you to find the next number in the sequence. Um, so of course, the last sequence here are the primes, the primes, the numbers at the heart of my talk, which go from 19 to 23. Then you get another big gap, uh, a, a big gap, the biggest so far seen, 23 jumps to 29. Then a very another close prime, 31. And I would say of all the numbers in mathematics, these ones are the most important. Because as I said, they're the building blocks of the whole of mathematics. I compared them to the chemist's periodic table. Um, now, the chemists have done incredibly well with their atoms. Um, here we have this lovely table telling you all the stable atoms from which you can build molecules. Um, they've also done another fantastic thing, which is to build a machine, a spectrometer, which if you give it a molecule, can tell you what the atoms are that built that molecule. So how well are the mathematicians doing compared to the chemists. Uh, well, let's take that second problem first. Uh, what about um, a, a machine that, uh, if you give it a number, will tell you the primes which built that number? Um, well, this is, in, in, in fact, a very difficult problem. And uh, to show you how difficult it is, I'm going to give you a little challenge um, for, the course, uh, for this lecture. Um, here's a number, 9,999,911. This is not a prime number. It's a bit like salt. It's made out of a sodium and chlorine. But you have to find the sodium and chlorine which built that number. And as is an incentive, um, I've got a bottle of, of um, champagne, which I will give to the first person who finds the two primes um, which built that number. Now, I know some people came in with their laptops, so they might be, uh, I was hoping to go away and enjoy myself tonight. But anyway, there's your challenge. I only have one bottle. It's the first person to shout out uh, gets the bottle. Um, it, I, it was cooling in my um, mini bar. In, uh, so it's, it's warming up in the lights. So if you want it, you solve it quickly, and it'll be cold. Um, um, OK, I'll come back a little later to um, this problem uh, and show you why, if you can win that bottle of champagne, there might be more prizes out there for you to win if you can really solve this problem. OK, what about the first problem, about um, perhaps producing a periodic table of the primes? Well, if you write down the primes in some sort of table, the trouble is that um, the primes they don't seem to have any pattern to them. If you look at here, the primes uh, from 1 to 100, and I've written it as a kind of heartbeat. So the, the, prime, uh, the, the, the heart beats every time it goes over a prime number. And I kind of really feel like the primes are the, are the heartbeat of mathematics. They run our subject. Um, but you can see this is, a, this is a heart, which probably needs to visit the cardiac department. Because uh, look, it, it jumps at 23, then has a big pause ooh, as the subject died. No, a double beat there, and then suddenly, whoa, no, a beat there. So the beat seems to be incredibly random. And in fact, mathematicians believe there's far more in common between the prime numbers and the lottery ticket numbers than between the primes and the Fibonacci and triangular numbers. It seems just hard to predict where the next prime is going to be as to predict the lottery. The way the primes are laid out seem to be as random as the lottery. And this is deeply frustrating for me as a mathematician, a pattern searcher, trying to understand these numbers. In fact, it wasn't mathematicians who were the first to discover these numbers at all, but a curious little insect which lives here in North America. Um, this insect, I can see somebody cheering over there. Is that because you like this insect? Or? Uh, great, excellent, good. Um, uh, so uh, we've got a, a fan for this insect up the back. Um, this insect is a cicada. 
and it has a very curious life cycle. This cicada hides underground doing absolutely nothing for 17 years. Then after 17 years, the cicadas all seem to know to emerge en masse simultaneously into the forest. And they uh, sing away. Here's the sound of one cicada. The sound of the cicadas is so unbearable, you've got to multiply this by about 100,000 of these things. Um, the, the residents move out of the area because it's so loud. Um, the cicadas party away. They eat the leaves. They mate. They lay eggs. And then after six weeks of partying, they all die. And the forest goes quiet again for another 17 years before the next generation appears. Now, 17, a prime number. Is it just a coincidence that they've chosen the prime number? Oh, well, it seems not. There's also another species which hides underground for 13 years, and another species which hides underground for seven years. So 7, 13, 17, all prime numbers. There must be something about the primes which is helping this cicada. But what is it? Well, we're not really too sure. Um, but the best hypothesis we have so far is that maybe there was a predator that also used to appear in the forest periodically, and the predator would try and time its arrival to coincide with the cicada. Now, the cicada that had a prime number life cycle found that it could keep out of sync much better than the predator, from the predator than those of the non-prime number life cycle. For example, if I've got a predator that appears every six years, then the cicada that appears every seven years won't meet it until year 42. But a cicada that appears every eight years or every nine years is going to meet that predator much earlier and get wiped out. So it seems like the cicadas that had a prime number life cycle were much better at avoiding the predator. And it seems to be in a real competition that went on in this forest um, where the predator perhaps found the, the cicada's prime, the cicada had to push its life cycle up, and it's a real... Um, uh, 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 a good example of you know your maths, then you survive in this world. Because this clever cicada found the number prime 17, the predator couldn't find it, died out, and now we seem to be left with these cicadas with this prime number life cycle. Uh, now, it isn't only cicadas that depend on uh, prime numbers for their survival. One of my favorite math movies of all time is a movie called The Cube. Has anyone seen The Cube? Yeah, great. So for a few more movie buffs, um, math movie buffs. And this, in this movie, um, Six characters wake up inside this cube-shaped room, and they don't know how they have got there, um, but uh, they start exploring. The, the cube-shaped room has four doors, uh, four, four doors in the walls, one in the ceiling, one in the floor. And they explore through these, um, the, the, these, wall, these rooms, and they find another room on the other side, another cube-shaped room. It's a very low-budget movie. It's the same set, just lit differently. But, um, uh, and, but after a while, they discover that some of the rooms are booby-trapped. And oh, you've got it already, have you? Go on, then. Yeah, I think that's right. Yes, very good. Well, there's my bottle gone. Ah, dear. Oh. OK, very fast. He's got one of those pesky electronic gadgets there that he uh, Well, I'll ask you later how you did that, OK, what you got your computer to do. But um, OK, so, in, in the, so these characters have to work out before they go into a room uh, whether the room is booby-trapped. And in this sequence, they finally discover the key to working out whether the room is booby-trapped or not. You don't need them. They're for being. Well, they took off her jewelry, but they must have put these on you. If nothing's random, why are they here? What can they mean? One forty nine. Numbers. I can't believe I didn't see it before. See what? It seems like if any of these numbers are prime, then the room is trapped. Okay, um, 6.45. That's not prime. 2.52. No. <laughs> you won't be surprised to find that they don't survive very long in this maze, so... Um... Right, 11 times 59. It's not prime either. So that room is safe. 
you make that assumption based on one prime number trap? I'm not. The incinerator thing was prime. 083. The molecular chemical thingy had 137. The acid room had 149. You remember all that in your head? I have a facility for it. Live in you beautiful brain. And if you all go away as excited about prime numbers as she is, I'll know I've done a good job. So, um, and um, if uh, any of you have uh, kids who are having trouble with their multiplication tables or prime numbers, any teachers here, um, this is what happens to you if you don't know your primes, okay? So um, uh, if you do get nightmares, I suggest you look away now. Um, but if you want some tricks to kind of terrify your kids, then um, here, here's what happens to you if you don't know your primes. There are some younger people here who might not like this, so. They're probably the ones who will like it, and the adults will, but. Ooh. Learn your primes, children. Learn your primes. In fact, I, I've recommended our government in Britain get every school in England one of these cheese graders, and we have numeracy sorted out in the UK. So maybe your, your next president might take a trick from this one. Anyway, so um, the uh, cicadas and the Hollywood seem to know about the primes, but it's really the ancient Greeks that we credit with the first great discoveries about the primes. And in particular, this Greek, uh, the mathematician Euclid, who proved what I believe is the first great theorem of mathematics, um, uh, which is um, the chemists, you see, they've made this table which lists all of their atoms. Maybe mathematicians could just produce a table of all the primes, and whenever I have a problem about the primes, I go to this table and look things up, and I'm finished. Well, Euclid proved that anyone who tried to write down the primes in some great big table would be writing forever, um, because he proved that there are infinitely many primes. The primes never run out. There are infinitely many of these indivisible numbers. Um, uh, so uh, I'm going to get my football team, in fact, to explain this uh, prime number proof to you. Um, uh, this is a little movie that I made, um, which is on the web. It's a five-minute movie, but I'm just going to show you a little clip. Um, how do we know? How can I really prove my football team has not shirts from 2 up to 43? How can I actually be sure there's another prime number shirt out there um, for my football team if we manage to sign some new players this summer? Um, how do I know we'll be able to always find another prime number shirt uh, for him to play in? I want to show that uh, the numbers in my football team, we had two up to 43. Suppose those are all the prime numbers there are. Perhaps you can build all other numbers by multiplying the primes in our football team together. Euclid came up with this clever way to show why there must be a number which can't be built out of those primes from 2 to 43. What he did was to take all our football shirts, multiply them together, so he did 2 times 3 times 5 times 7, all the way up to 43. Then here was his act of genius. What he did was to add 1 to this number. Now, can this new number that Euclid built be built out of any of the primes in our football team? Well, no, because if you divide that number of Euclids by any of the numbers in our football team, you always get remainder one. And so Euclid's found a number which isn't built out of any of the primes in our football team. So there must be another football shirt with a different prime number which is helping you to build that number that Euclid's built. It's such a beautiful argument. If any of you came to me and said, look, I've got a table with all the prime numbers in, I can show you that you've missed some from your list. I multiply all the prime numbers together in your table, then I add one to that number, and then this new number is not divisible by any of your primes, because it always leaves the remainder one. 
So you must be missing some primes. Sometimes that's a new prime number, but very often it is not a new prime number. It's just built by primes that are missing from your list. Even if you add those new primes to your list, I can play the same trick again. Multiply the new list of primes together, add one, and you still miss some primes. Now the real trouble, Euclid had proved that there are infinitely many primes, but he couldn't tell you how to find them. Um, and this was the great challenge. For 2,000 years, we've been trying to find a way to find prime numbers. Maybe we can find a formula to help us to find the primes. And every formula never really worked. Um, now, what makes a really great mathematician, in my mind, is somebody who can do lateral thinking. Somebody who can look at a problem in a new way. And what we needed with the primes was somebody to take a new perspective. I like this quote from Enrico Bombieri, who's an expert in prime numbers um, here in American Princeton. He said, when things get too complicated, it sometimes makes sense to stop and wonder, have I asked the right question? And maybe with the primes, we're just asking the wrong question, trying to predict when the next prime is going to occur, where, whether there's a formula for the primes. And the person who changed the question when it came to the primes and found a way into finding patterns in these numbers was the great mathematician Carl Friedrich Gauss. Now, Gauss was clearly going to be a great mathematician from the word go. Already at the age of three, he was apparently correcting his father's arithmetic when he was handing out wages at the end of the week. Um, so perhaps not surprising that when he got to 15, uh, the thing he asked for his birthday that year was a book of mathematical tables. The kind of thing we like to get for our birthdays, a book of mathematical tables. Um, now, this book of tables is a book of logarithm tables. Now, I just need to find out um, how many, put your hand up if you know what a logarithm is, please. Okay. Good, excellent. How many of you have actually used a set of logarithm tables? Yes, yeah, all the old people in the room now putting it. Oh, so put my hand. And the point about a logarithm, and if you don't know what a logarithm, this is all you need to know what, about it, is that logarithms were these kind of ancient form of calculator, because a logarithm does something very clever. It turns multiplication into addition. Multiplying two large numbers is quite difficult to, get to do, but adding two numbers together is very easy. So these logarithm tables facilitated doing arithmetic. And so um, merchants, navigators, engineers would use these tables in order to do calculations. Now, it wasn't actually the, the logarithms which interested Gauss. At the back of this book of logarithm tables was a book of prime numbers, was a table of prime numbers. And Gauss began to get obsessed with these numbers. He couldn't understand any pattern to them at all. Uh, for the rest of his life, he would add more and more primes to this list. Instead of going out on the town in Göttingen at night, he would say, no, I'm sorry, guys, I've got to stay and do some more prime numbers. And he would add more and more primes to these tables. And by asking a new question, changing the perspective, Gauss, amazingly, found a connection between the primes at the back of the book and the logarithms at the front of the book. Almost spooky that he got given this book with the two things together, and he found a connection between them. So what was the new question that Gauss asked that made him make this connection? Well, Gauss said, OK, well, let's not get obsessed with trying to find the next prime, trying to get a formula. Let's try and count how many primes there are. OK, you might say that's a very stupid thing to do, because Euclid and my football team have already shown you there are infinitely many primes, so how can you count them? Uh, well, Gauss said, no, let's try and count how many primes are there in the first 10 numbers, for example. So you've got 2, 3, 5, and 7. So there are four primes up to 10. Up to 100, well, that heartbeat that I showed you, it beat 25 times all the way up to 100. So there are 25 primes less than 100. So what Gauss wondered is, is there any way we can predict how the number of primes grows as you count higher and higher? Now, Gauss liked to view things graphically, actually a time in mathematics when uh, pictures were viewed with a lot of suspicion. So here's actually a graph of this function. So the height of the, the graph, uh, say above 100, the height is 25 because it tells you there are 25 primes less than 100. And uh, I like to call this the staircase of the primes, because every time you go over a new prime number, the graph takes a step upwards. So for example, we have a new prime number at 101, so the, the graph would take a step up at 101. OK, well, what Gauss said was, let's not get obsessed with the minutiae of this gra graph. Let's take a step backwards and see if there's any overall pattern to the way this staircase is growing. And the pattern that Gauss found is in this last column here. Um, so let me tell you what this last column records. Um, so for example, the number of primes less than 100, there are 25 primes less than 100. So this last column records the proportion of primes amongst all numbers up to that point. So there are, it, this means that 1 in 4, 25 out of 100, 1 in 4 numbers is a prime number up to 100. So that's what this last column here records. So for example, around 10 million, um, here are the number of primes, less than 10 million. Um, 
Well, now 1 in 15 numbers, so this is the important column, 1 in 15 numbers is a prime number. So I, I live in London. My London telephone number has about that many digits. Um, so the probability that my London telephone number is a prime number is a 1 in 15 chance that my London telephone number is a prime number. Now, of course, being a math nerd, as soon as I get a telephone number, I always check to see whether it really is a prime number. And uh, I moved house last uh, couple of summers ago, and um, I had to change my telephone number. So I phoned the woman up to get a new telephone number, and she gave me this number, and I put it into my computer and tested it, and it wasn't the prime number. So um, I said, oh, I'm never going to remember that one. Can you give me another one? So um, <laughs> she said, oh, OK, all right. So she gave me another one. I quickly tapped it in, and um, uh, still wasn't prime. So I said, oh, no, I won't remember that either. So, um, so she gave me about five numbers, by which time she got so annoyed with me that uh, she just gave me the next number which came out. So I now have an even telephone number of all things. So hopeless. But, um, anyway, I probably would have had to have waited for about 15 numbers, and one in 15 of those would have a chance of being prime. And what Gauss spotted was a pattern in this last column here. Um, and you can think of this, uh, in a way, what Gauss was looking for was a good model to help him to predict the number of primes. And in a way, you can think of this as, um, say, that it's the probability that a number is prime. So, for example, around 1,000, there's a 1 in 6 chance that a number is prime. So what Gauss produced was a kind of model um, to help him predict the way the primes behaved. And in some sense, uh, so this is a slightly modern interpretation of this model. But in a way, this last column here sort of says, well, the primes look very random. So maybe nature chose them with a set of prime number dice. And uh, there's a prime on one side and five sides blank. And around, around 1,000, she'd say, OK, well, is 1,000 a prime? Toss the dice, lands on the P side, circle that as a prime. Uh, now, clearly, 1,000 isn't a prime. The point is that Gauss thought this might be a good model to predict the way the primes might behave. So another way to interpret this last column is it's the number of sides on the prime number dice as you climb higher and higher and work out where the primes are. So the pattern starts to emerge here. So um, around, uh, around 10,000, there are 8.1 sides on the prime number dice. OK, 8.1 sides. I'm happy with mathematical dice with 8.1 sides on. Um, OK, what happens when I multiply by 10? I go from 10,000 to 100,000. The number of sides on the prime number dice goes up from 8.1 to 10.4. I've added 2.3 to the number of sides on the dice. Now multiply by 10 again, go from 100,000 to a million. The number of sides on the prime number dice goes up again by adding 2.3. Multiply by 10 here, add 2.3. Multiply by 10, OK, I've got 2.4, but what's happened is there's a bit of rounding up going on. But essentially, there's a very strong pattern emerging in the way the primes are thinning out. I always seem to be adding 2.3 every time I multiply this first column by 10. And here's the connection with the logarithms at the front of that book. Logarithms turn multiplication into addition. So the logarithm is the key to working out when the probability that a number is prime. You take the logarithm of the number, and that will tell you whether the number, what the probability is that the number is prime. So the, the logarithm function is, is actually telling us the number of sides on the prime number dice, the probability that a number is prime. And that was Gauss's, um, that was Gauss's prediction. This is a guess that he made as a 15-year-old child. Absolutely astounding that he found this pattern, this irregularity in the way the primes thin out at the age of 15. Um, so the logarithm function tells us how many primes there are on the prime number, uh, how many sides there are on the prime number dice. And once you know the probability that a number is prime, you can start to make predictions about how many primes you're going to get. If I toss this dice 30 times, it will tell me that there are roughly five uh, primes that I'm expecting to get. So between 1,000 and 1,029, I can make a guess that there should be about five primes inside there. I won't exactly know where they are, but I can predict there are about five. Um, so this is um, uh, the number of primes that Gauss would guess there are less than any number n. And uh, this is a slight refinement that he made in later life, something called the logarithmic integral. But you can see it hugs the, um, the shape, the way the staircase of the primes um, grows quite well. But that's a theoretical analysis of this dice. And of course, dice don't necessarily land exactly five times on the prime side. And you actually look how many primes there are between 1,000 and 1,029. You find there are only four. So there's a little bit of error cropping in. Um, so Gauss has got a good first guess at how, how the number of primes emerges. But it's only an approximation. Now, that's good enough for an engineer, but for a mathematician, we like things to be precise. We like to have exact formulas. So how can we correct this formula that Gauss has and get an exact 
prediction of the number of primes that this dice is predicting. Well, it wasn't Gauss, but Gauss's student Riemann who found a way into this problem and actually understood what's making this prime number dice tick, how it's distributing the primes. Now, the best way to describe what Riemann did is to explain a little bit about the theory of music. And this is why I've called the talk the music of the primes. Um, so I'm going to start to really push you now. So um, brace yourselves for perhaps not understanding everything that I'm going to say now. But I really just want to show you some of this mathematics because it's my favorite bit of mathematics in the whole of my subject. Um, OK. so. Scientists around Riemann's time discovered, in particular a guy called Fourier, discovered that just as primes are the building blocks of numbers, the building blocks of sound and of graphs is the sound that a tuning fork makes. So here's a tuning fork here. Oops, well, I've got it in here. Let's um, play it through here. Now, a tuning fork, when you record the sound of a tuning fork on an oscilloscope, it produces a perfect sine wave. And what um, scientists discovered is that these sine waves are the building blocks of all sounds. So anyone who has an MP3 player, what's that, what that MP3 player is doing is taking the sound of a band or an orchestra and breaking it down into these sine waves, the building blocks, which build up the sound of that orchestra or band. So for example, a violin, the sound of a violin when it's playing an A, it sounds very different from the tuning fork, very sort of sharp sound to it. Uh, and the oscilloscope uh, records a completely different shape. It's almost like the, saw, uh, the teeth on a saw. Um, but the point is that the violin isn't just playing the A of the tuning fork. It's also playing a lot of other harmonics as well, a lot of other sine waves. So in fact, the violin is playing a lot of tuning forks all together. So the first tuning fork you're hearing is the, the, um, the, this sine wave here, which is essentially the sine wave which fits from the bridge of the violin to the top of the violin here. But there's another sine wave which fits here, which is vibrating twice as fast. It has half the wavelength, and that produces a note an octave higher, which is also contributing to the sound. In fact, you're hearing all the sine waves which fit perfectly in the length of the violin. I don't know whether I can do something clever, but... Uh, oh, I have to get closer to it there. But essentially, that's the, um, the sine waves which fit the length of the violin are all the notes that you're hearing. And if you combine those sine waves together, so I'm going to add the graphs of these sine waves together, you see the, 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 sh the shape of the tuning fork gradually turning into the shape of the sawtooth of the violin. So what I'm going to do is here's the, the tuning fork, the first approximation to the violin. Then I'm going to add another sine wave, which is vibrating twice as fast. So you see it's going to push this bit of the graph up because it's going to add this, but then it's negative here. It's going to pull this bit of the graph down. So as add, I add on all of the harmonics of the, uh, of the violin, the graph gets pushed and pulled until the, the tuning fork turns into the sawtooth shape of the violin. And suddenly you're hearing, if you play all those sine waves together, you'll get tricked into hearing a violin. In fact, of course, that's what my computer is doing. It's vibrating the loudspeakers, but all of those sine waves together, and you think you're hearing a violin. Now, uh, this is very important, for example, for a trumpeter. Um, a trumpeter, uh, especially before Bach's era, uh, a trumpeter didn't have valves and couldn't change the length of the string or the length of the pipe. Um, and so he would have to depend on the harmonics to get more notes. So, for example, I'm not going to change the length of the pipe, but by pushing more energy through the trumpet, you're going to hear the different sine waves, which essentially fit the length of the trumpet. <laughs> So those are essentially the sine waves which make up the sound of the trumpet. And a trumpeter has to use these sine waves a lot whenever he's playing some music. So um, just to give you a little light entertainment, um, here is a little bit of music which depends on using these harmonics in order to be actually able to play something. I'm afraid the band had a chance to warm up, so they were a bit better than me. But, um, well, each instrument has its own different harmonics. So for example, the clarinet 
um, which has a very closed sound, um, much not a sharp sound like the violin. Uh, and you can see this on the oscilloscope. It has a much squarer shape. And this is because the harmonics, which fit inside the clarinet, they have to be open at one end and closed at the other one. So we get sine waves of different frequencies which build up the sound of the clarinet. So actually you have the first wavelength here, and then you have one which is a third the wavelength of the original frequency. So clarinets actually like odd numbers. And if we combine the different frequencies of the clarinet together, the harmonics, um, we get a different shaped graph. So both instruments start with the approximation of the sine wave, but then let's add on a, frequent, uh, a sine wave which is vibrating three times as fast. So it goes down in the middle now. So it's going to pull the middle of the graph down, and the tops get pushed up. And so instead of getting a sawtooth shape, the clarinet, with these different harmonics, gets a much more square shape um, to its graph for the sound. OK, what on earth has all this music got to do with the primes? Well, what Riemann discovered is the primes also have strange harmonics hiding behind them, which help to correct Gauss's guess. So Gauss's guess you can think of a little bit like um, the tuning fork. It's the first approximation to the primes. But what Riemann discovered using some very powerful mathematics involving something called the, the zeta function, complex numbers, by the sort of ma act of mathematical alchemy, he produced essentially these sine waves, which when you add them on to the Gauss's guess, they kind of push and pull Gauss's guess in a similar way to the, the clarinet emerging, the sound of the clarinet emerging from the tuning fork, Adding on these harmonics um, actually corrects Gauss's guess such you get an exact formula. So there are slight variations on sine waves. Um, and essentially, um, if you know uh, a little bit about where this is coming from, these essentially each note corresponds to something called a zero of the Riemann zeta function. And if you add on all of these harmonics onto Gauss's guess, you get an exact formula for the primes. So I'm going to show you a little animated version of Riemann's formula for the primes. Now, th this, if I had to choose one, if I was cast out on a desert island and I had to choose one formula to take, take with me on that island, it probably would be this formula of Riemann's. It's my favorite formula. So I wanted to show you an animated version of it. Um, so what Riemann's formula says is that, OK, we want to count the number of primes. That's the blue staircase here going up here. That is equal to Gauss's guess, which uses the logarithm function in these dice. That's this yellow graph here. It's actually a slight um, improvement that Riemann made. Um, but that's not exact yet. Then we have to add on the sine waves that Riemann found using the zeta function. So the sine waves, uh, we're going to add on these sine waves, and then you get an exact formula. So I'm going to show you an animation where here's Gauss's guess, and I'm going to add on a sine wave, the, um, the harmonics that Riemann discovered, one by one. So remember, they're basically waves which go up and down like this. Um, so I'm going to add them onto the graph. So when the graph is going down, it's going to pull the yellow graph down, because it's saying, OK, you've slightly overestimated the number of primes. Come down a bit. When the sine wave goes up, you have to push the graph upwards. It says, no, you've underestimated. Now push it up a little bit. So I'm going to add on, one at a time, these um, harmonics that Riemann discovered. And gradually, you'll see the graph being pushed and pulled, being approximated better. OK, a little bit more here. Pull it down here. And after you add on about 100 of these harmonics, um, this is the prime numbers from 1 to 100. After 100 of these harmonics, you've managed to push and pull the graph until you've got a pretty good match for the number of primes. And if you add on the infinitely many of these harmonics, you'll get a precise formula for the number of primes. So now, with these somehow hidden inside these harmonics, are exactly where this prime number of dice is landing. I mean, with, with Gauss's guess, you couldn't tell there were no primes between 23 and 29. But somehow the harmonics have hidden inside them the way the prime number dice are distributing the primes. Now, there are two important pieces of information your iPod needs to know about a frequency when it's building up the sound of a band. One is the frequency of the harmonic, but also how loud you want that frequency to play. Um, is it a very loud contribution or a very small one? So Riemann essentially looked at the, the same thing for the primes. He made a graph and said, OK, well, let's plot on the, the, uh, the, um, the vertical um, the, uh, the frequency of the note. So that's essentially how fast it's vibrating. And on the, the horizontal here, we're going to uh, chart how loud the harmonic is. So that's really the amplitude of the wave. How big is the sine wave? Is it a very loud one or is it a very small one? When Riemann plotted 10 of these notes. He did calculations. He managed to calculate where 10 of these notes would lie. He found that they weren't scattered all over the place, with some notes playing higher than other, uh, louder than others, uh, some making bitter contributions. He found that all the notes were lining up in some straight line. All the notes seemed to be in some perfect balance. Um, they were all lining up with the same kind of volume. Now, Riemann believed that this couldn't just be a coincidence. There must be uh, that 
the, all the nodes would be lying on this line. And uh, Riemann made a prediction, it's called the Riemann hypothesis, that all of these notes would be playing at the same volume. Now, for 150 years, we've been trying to prove that Riemann was right about these notes, that the volume of these notes is somehow in this perfect balance, and we haven't been able to prove it. It is our greatest unsolved problem. It's one of the reasons that the, the Clays chose it as one of the millennium problems. It probably is, I would say, the greatest of those seven millennium problems. And what the amazing thing is the Riemann hypothesis, if it's true, there's this pattern in the primes, in some ways it will explain to us why we're not, sorry, there's a pattern in the notes. It will somehow explain to us why there aren't any patterns in the primes. Because um, if there was a note off that line, it would say that one of the notes is playing much louder than any of the other notes. And Enrico Bombieri describes it very nicely. He says, this would be like listening to an orchestra where everything's in a beautiful balance, and then suddenly one note comes in, one instrument, the tuba comes in, and blasts out the rest of the orchestra, and all you hear is the tuba. Now, if that were true, it would really force a very strong pattern on the primes. It would say there are loads of primes over here and hardly any here. So the fact that the notes are somehow all playing at the same volume, all playing the same role, is kind of distributing the primes in a very fair way with no sort of patterns emerging in them. So a pattern in the music will, in a sense, explain why there are no patterns in the primes. Another way to interpret the Riemann hypothesis is that the primes are a little bit like the molecules of gas in this room. Now, I don't exactly know where each molecule of gas is, but I do know that if I go into the corner here, I'm not going to suddenly find a vacuum and I'll die and collapse because I've got no oxygen, and there's a concentration somewhere else. So the Riemann hypothesis will say something very similar to the way the, uh, for the primes about the way the molecules of gas are distributed here. The Riemann hypothesis doesn't really help you to tell where the primes are. What it does say is that the primes are fairly distributed around the universe of numbers, so that you won't find somewhere where there are hardly any primes. It actually says, very equivalently, that these prime number dice are a fair set of dice, so the errors that they're making, either way of the theoretical number, are what you'd expect from a fair set of dice. And so uh, it's very intriguing that the, the randomness of the primes, I said at the beginning that a, a mathematician is a pattern searcher. And nature gave us these numbers which didn't seem to have any pattern to them at all, just noisy numbers. But by changing our perspective, looking at things in a new way, going through the Gauss's dice with these logarithms, through to the music of Riemann, we suddenly found where the real pattern is. The pattern is in this music and not in the primes themselves. So it's really this triumph of the mathematician somehow over nature. Um, now, if you want to discover a little bit more about how far we've got in the, uh, in the, the search to prove this theorem, there's strange connections now with quantum physics, um, the frequencies of these, uh, of these notes of Riemann seem to share a lot in common with frequencies and energy levels in, in quantum physics. Um, uh, so here's your guide to winning the, the clay million, if you want. Um, now, I, I study the primes really because I think they're beautiful, because there's something very universal about them. If there was another lecture going on on the other side of the galaxy, we might all look very different, our chemistry might be different, our biology, but the primes would still be the pr same primes, they'd be the same numbers we're talking about. But now there's a very practical reason for studying the primes. And that's why the problem that I set um, right at the beginning to crack these numbers into uh, the prime constituents, this problem is now at the heart of the codes uh, which are being used on the internet to keep credit cards secure. Actually, this code was developed here in MIT by three mathematicians um, who realized that the primes, you can use the fact that we don't really understand the primes to build a code that is really hard to crack. So every time you go onto the internet and visit a website and you want to send them your credit card, what you're getting is a public kind of e-telephone number for that website, something like this number here. And your computer does a calculation with your credit card and this public number here, scrambles the credit card number up, sends it to the website. To unscramble that calculation, you don't need to know this big number here, but the two primes which built that number. Those primes are kept very secret by the website. They're what undo the calculation. So uh, what uh, our gentleman here did, he won a bottle of champagne, but watch out because he might be after your credit cards because if he's got a clever way, now how did you actually, you presumably got your little machine just to check one prime after another until it hit 307 and then suddenly the thing breaks into two. But Google, exactly. Well, what's Google doing? Google is uh, basically doing exactly that. Okay, well, <laughs> yeah, he's definitely after your credit cards. So I'd watch it. Um, <laughs> Essentially, the only clever ways we know so far as mathematicians, we have slightly sophisticated, more sophisticated ways, is to just try one prime after another. 
this number is small enough that Google or even uh, somebody on their pocket calculator would crack it very quickly. But of course, websites are using numbers with now a couple of hundred digits. And to be able to do, use that method to crack that into primes um, will take you uh, the lifetime of the universe to be able to actually find the primes which build it. But maybe if we actually found a proof of the Riemann hypothesis, it might tell us many more things about the primes. Whenever you prove something, it doesn't just prove your theorem. It generally shows you many more things beyond that as well. So there's a possibility that the Riemann hypothesis may give us an enough insight to be able to, to build a prime number spectrometer, which helps us to crack these numbers in seconds. And I'm going to end with a sequence from another of my favorite math movies um, called Sneakers. Uh, in Sneakers, um, there's a mathematician called Dr. Yannick who has indeed found a way to find the primes which build all of the numbers. He's programmed it into a little black box. Um, then uh, the evil Ben Kingsley uh, uh, gets the black box, shoots the mathematician. It's never good for mathematicians. We either get mad or we get shot by the end of the movie. This one, we get shot. Um, but then Robert Redford of River Phoenix rescue back this little black box. They plug it into their computer. And this is the kind of thing you'll be able to do if you understand the primes well enough. Air traffic control system. Mm. Okay, mother. Oh, my gosh. How is this possible? Cryptography systems are based on mathematical problems so complex they cannot be solved without a key. Janik must have figured out a way to solve those problems without the key, and he hardwired it into that chip. Turn it off. Anybody want to crash a couple of passenger jets? I turn it off. Turn it off. So it's a code breaker. No. It's the code breaker. No more secrets. In a surprise announcement, the Republican National Committee has revealed it is bankrupt. A spokesman for the party said they had plenty of money in their accounts last week, but today they just don't know where the money has gone. But not everybody's going begging. Amnesty International, Greenpeace, and the United Negro College Fund announced record earnings this week, mostly to large anonymous donations. Well, it could only happen in the movies, couldn't it? Or could it? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marcus. Uh, we probably have time for two questions. Yes. Ah, oh, right. Yes. A oh, excellent. Yes. Yes. A prime number sieve. Yes. Exactly. That's. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. I'll remember that one. Any other questions? Yeah. Question in the back. Do I think it'll be solved in our lifetime? That's a very good question. Um, it's always hard to make predictions about mathematical problems. Uh, I think uh, when I started my research, I would have thought Fermat's last theorem was never going to be proved. And then suddenly a new idea comes along, and, and, uh, and you've got to weigh in. I would say that we're probably just one big idea away from proving the Riemann hypothesis. Now, I don't know when that idea is going to come, but, um, but in some ways, we've got uh, a, a good um, a good idea of how we should be proving it. There's a, a similar theorem called the Riemann hypothesis for curves, which is not about counting primes, but counting solutions to equations. And we've been able to prove that. We've built a machinery which helps us to prove that particular theorem. Uh, now, we believe that we've got to build the same sort of machinery um, for the primes, and we'll find a way into it. And in a way, the connections with quantum physics are telling us the sort of mathematics that we should be using is the sort of mathematics which gets used in quantum physics, which is basically, if you know what these technical terms is, is an operator and looking at the eigenvalues of that operator, like a big matrix, and the matrix, um, uh, the, the, the way it sort of pushes and pulls space will have something to do with these primes. So, so in some ways, I, I would expect to see a proof 
um, before we celebrate 200 years of Riemann's um, prediction. In fact, next year, it will be 150 years uh, since Riemann made that prediction. Um, next year is a big year for Darwin. The Origin of Species was published in 1859, but also The Origin of the Primes, Riemann's paper, was published in the same year as well. So. Let's give Marcus a big hand. Thanks so much. Thank you.